This is the Can Crushers Wrestling Podcast. The following contest is scheduled for one fall. Let's go nuts! It's Jimmy Nuts! Die out of the door! With your host, Mark Martinez. Because I'm the Mark. And I'm awesome! The Guru. Today I'm going to break it down for all you simpleton sweat hogs listening out there in Can Crusher Nation. I don't mean to come out here week after week and toot my own horn, but toot, toot. And the English Professor. It is I, the English Professor from the County of Kings, speaking the English of the Queen. Hey, this is former WWE superstar Duke, the Dumpster Drossy, and you are listening to the Can Crushers Podcast. And welcome back to another Can Crushers Spotlight. This one is going to be big. I mean big time big. But before we get to the interview, I want to welcome my co-host of sorts. This must be a big one because you're here, the English professor, John Paglano. Thanks for having me, Mark. Um... And as you said, it's not only big, it's big time. Yeah, this guy, John, let's uh, stop beating around the bush right now. This guy is one of our favorites in IWC. He's one of our favorites in Imagine. In fact, he's one of my favorite matches of all time, beating up one of my favorites of all time. And we'll get to all of those. It's big time Bill Collier. He really is... um... An awesome athlete, a special talent, um, and, and you and I, maybe you and I don't have as close of a connection to big time Bill Collier as our children do. Uh, both of our children have had yeah. run-ins of sorts with big time, and we'll talk about that, but uh, yeah, Ethan and Sylvan have had their uh, their run-ins with big time. They, they really have. Man, this guy is great, though, John. We've talked about him all year on the show, especially when we do IWC recaps. He he does the fall away slam like nobody's business. He does a really good one, and then he does a, a kip up out of it. Um, has good matches regardless of the opponent, whether uh, the opponent's a newbie, whether the opponent's a, a long time seasoned veteran. You get a very good match, uh, and always the potential for match of the night on any card that features big time Bill Collier. Scratch that, John. It's match of the year. Well, I'm of course, yes, that is absolutely uh, the case. But I'm saying on, on any given event, anywhere oh, he oh. appears, um, you've got the potential for the match of the night if he's on the card. Yeah, for sure. So we'll get into that interview with Big Time Bill Collier. But first, we have to tell you about our boy Al Snow and Collar and Elbow. John, actually, like most of my stuff is in the wash right now because we uh, we were always transparent on the show. We haven't done wash in a week. We've been that lazy around the show this week. We have. It's It's been the holidays. Yeah, I get it. I'm, I'm a little behind, too. And if I'm being honest, I'm, I'm wearing my son's baseball team's hoodie right now, which is – I'm not just saying this, and I'm not knocking my son's baseball team. Not as comfortable as my brand spanking new collar and elbow hoodie. Yeah, I agree. I have my, my new pit hoodie that the wife got me as long for Christmas, but not as breathing – but collar and elbow. Very well said. Hat, hoodies, tees, and pantalones as well. And, John, we have a special promo code. What is it? It is Can Crushers. All one word, capital C and Can, capital C and Crushers. And if you use that promo code, guys, you'll save some money. Mark, how much will you save? 10%. That pretty much equals shipping anymore. Right. Uh, just Yeah, yeah, just about. Yep. Just about. So, all right, here comes Al, and then we'll be back with... Big time, Bill Collier, and see if he feels sorry for what he did to our kids. Wrestling, a love and a passion we all share. I've started a wrestling brand, the wrestling brand. A brand founded on the aspects of wrestling. Two entities working together to create a product that connect emotionally for people everywhere. Collar and Elbow is the brand. Passion and love for wrestling is the drive. 
I am Al Snow, and this is Collar and Elbow, the wrestling brand. And welcome back to Can Crushers. It is I, the English professor, joined by your host, Mark the Mark Martinez. And we are joined for this week's spotlight by none other than Imagine Wrestling champion, big time Bill Collier. Bill Collier, welcome to the Can Crushers. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. It sounds like uh, you're pumping a little iron right now, getting a little workout in as you're on Can Crushers, huh? That is exactly what it is I'm doing. So uh, I'm multi-talented as well, uh, kicking ass in the ring and pumping iron while I talk to you guys. That's impressive. That is impressive. That's better than you eating a sandwich on the show, John. Yeah, yeah, it is more impressive. Than, that was just two things. I was eating a sandwich and doing the show. He's pumping iron, wrestling, and doing the show. Right. He's better than you. He's, that's why he's big time. That's right. So we talk about Imagine Championship, and it's great to let's start there, and we'll shift over to IWC and then this wrestling in general. Two matches with Spencer Slade that stole the summer there in Altoona. Um, let's talk about those a little bit and how they were a little bit different since they were kind of quarantine matches, but damn, you guys brought it. Um, you know, the first one I was... Uh... I, I don't want to say nervous, but that was a little apprehensive. They were outdoors. We had uh, four months off, and it was a double shot. I had wrestled Andrew Palace earlier in the day. Uh, the bell time for that was about 1 p.m., if I'm not mistaken. And uh, it, at bell time, I want to say the temperature was somewhere around 95 degrees. Yeah, for so IWC, Palace, yeah. Yeah, Andrew Palace and me opened up IWC in 95 degree heat and then spencer slade later that night um i was just wondering like am i gonna have the gas for this and uh of course you know i, I had the gas for it i was ready <laughs> i i spent the um i spent the uh entire uh, winter into spring headed into summer and i've only told a few people this i've completely i completely disconnected from wrestling um I didn't think we were coming back anytime soon, so I didn't watch it, didn't listen to it, didn't talk about it, didn't keep up with it. Um, I was upset because uh, the gyms were closed, everything was closed down, so I spent the first week wallowing in misery because I couldn't work out. There's no wrestling. There, there was nothing. And then I guess it was good for my body. I took the week off, and then at the end of the week, I thought, all right, uh, enough of this. Let's see what we can do about, uh, you know, building a gym at home. So that, that's what happened. I took that, that spring into summer and built myself a complete home gym facility. That way I could stay in shape at home in the event this happens again. I won't be left out in the cold. I'll have my own equipment. And this is where I've been working out uh, the majority of my time. Even when, when the gyms open back up, I, I pretty much stayed here at home and, uh, I have enough to torture myself. <laughs> <laughs> did you have equipment or did you go out and, and buy a whole bunch of stuff mm -hmm. and create a gym in your house? No. Cause for 20 years I worked out in the gym and all I had in my home was like one bench, a pair of 10 pound dumbbells and 15 pound dumbbells and like two bands. And I said, this, this is not going to be enough. This is not going to be enough. So I started looking, and uh, as you can imagine, the price of weight equipment reached that of trying to buy a kidney on the black market. <laughs> I was like, what? I was like what, what, are, what are these people doing? Well, I found a guy in the Pittsburgh area <clears throat> who became my, uh, for the lack of a better term, my weight dealer, <laughs> uh, whose name I will not disclose. <laughs> anytime I need something, he gets it for me. <laughs> Everybody's got a weight dealer in their cell phone, right? Like the old uh, Nickelback song, everybody's got a drug dealer. Bill Collier's got a weight yeah. dealer. <laughs> um, the 15-pound dumbbells, Mark, that, that wouldn't even be much of a challenge for you and me. I imagine a guy who's 6'4", 6'5", 260 pounds probably eats that stuff for breakfast. So, yeah, I imagine he had to be going a little batty uh, trying to get a workout. It was not even enough to warm up. 
but like with the bands and dumbbells and some creativity, um, I got through like the next two weeks uh, doing some creative home workouts and the adjustment was good. But once I started accumulating, like I had some generous donations, like I got a bench and a rack from my brother-in-law who, by the way, has a key to my house so he can come over and use the equipment anytime he likes. So that that's the trade-off. Like brother-in-law comes over whenever he wants because I have his rack, I have his bench. Um, I got some generous donations. Like I got a bar, I got some dumbbell handles. But like I said, my, my weight dealer in the Pittsburgh area was the guy. It was my go-to guy. He hooked me up. He really did. This really does sound like we're going on the dark web. So let's switch it over to wrestling a little bit. Um, I want to talk about the first time that I actually saw you in the ring, Bill. But I actually didn't know it was you in the ring. Uh, you were you were in the last wrestling show to ever happen in Ridgeway, Pennsylvania in 2011. And prior to the show, we talked about how you hate and beat on our kids. But uh, that night, my, my son got in the ring with you, and I don't know, you let him spear you or something, and then he rolled out at the age of four like he was Gilberg. I mean Goldberg, one or the other. Uh, do you remember that event in, in Ridgeway? I do vaguely remember that event. Somebody had posted not too long ago on uh, Facebook. There was a newspaper article that came out, I guess, day after, and my photo was the one they had used. Um, I do remember the event vaguely. Um, I remember the matches. Not so much like coming and going as you can imagine over the years. It, it, you do so many of these, and you're in and out of these towns before you even know what's going on. But I am familiar with the Ridgeway area and the fire hall there. It's, like, right next to Sheets, so that was a great thing for me. <laughs> yeah, and that's right. It's uh, the great thing for Ridgeway. Sheets is kind of like our only uh, fast food restaurant. We've got a ton of pizza joints, but Sheets is the only place you can get fast food. Well you, have, well, you have a subway around the corner there as well, like within walking distance. There's a subway with an eye shot of there. I know that. Yeah, the we, whole town is within walking distance. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. An old shutdown, an old shutdown swimming pool right across from the fire hall. Like I do know, like a little bit about Rich Way there. Well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, <laughs> but I appreciate it. Thank yeah, I, I just wanted to bring up. I, I don't know. I really, I was shocked to see that I didn't. I know this, and then I was telling John Pryor that. My wife's got a picture somewhere, and of course, could I find it? No, to be able to show you, but it's some IWC event, I'll make sure I, I uh, or Imagine event, I'll make sure I'll bring this to you and say, look, my son speared you. So, yeah. Well, absolutely, yeah, de definitely do that. I'll, I'll return the favor. What, spearing him back? He's 14 now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he can handle it then. He can absolutely handle it. Right. Uh, let's do the rewind real quick, and then this, then we'll get into the tougher questions. Who introduced you to wrestling? Was it Aunt Sally, Uncle Bill? You know, who who was it that said, man, you guys have to watch this? Uh, you know, I'm not real clear how that happened, if you want me to be perfectly honest. It, it's one of those things that goes back so far that I, I can't remember a time without it. I can't remember, like, a lot of you hear a lot of stories about, you know, I, I would go to Grandma's house or Grandpa's house, and they, they would have it on, and they'd sit me down. I don't have one of those like stories because to me it was, it seemed like it was something that was kind of always there. So I'm not exactly sure who it was or how, but my memory doesn't go back far enough to where I can remember a time where it wasn't there. Like I can remember old, like old, like Hogan versus Orndorff type like matches. Um, you know, I can remember. It, good guy Andre and Hulk Hogan teaming up like even years before their WrestleMania match. Like I can remember like back of that far. That, so this is John, this is somebody that's finally speaking my language. We have the recollection of it, but we can't pinpoint when the hell that, you know, you can say on yeah, April 3rd, this day. Yeah, I really can. I, I don't have a, a recollection of who or why or how. It just seemed like it was always there. It was always on. It was always around. And um, it, it, I guess it was that one thing that I was like, hey, hey I, I like this. And most kids end up you know, outgrowing whatever it is that they're into as kids. And like many of us that stick with this, this was that one thing that I kind of never really outgrew. And it was kind of like always there. Bill, were you a WCW fan at all? Did you ever head over to the War Memorial in the 
early I, mid nineties when WCW really blew up? One time I was uh, one time I wasn't a big WCW fan, but I was a kid, and I had just told this story recently. And as a kid, I didn't really understand it. It's hard to pinpoint an age here too, maybe eight, nine years old, maybe. Um, the only thing I can remember as a young kid, because I wasn't so much a WCW fan, like I, I knew who the guys were. Um, but I really wasn't that interested. Like for a young kid, you can imagine like the larger than life comic book character style, like guys appealed to me, like Hulk Hogan, Ultimate Warrior, these guys that were real flashy over the top. I didn't appreciate some of the like ring technicians until I had gotten a little older and studied. Um, but I'm also a teenager during the Attitude Era where you didn't watch nitro and raw you watched one or the other there was like separate cafeteria tables in school and you didn't talk to those guys because they watched nitro and we watched raw <laughs> but um i can specifically remember one wcw event that i found myself at and somehow we had made our way behind the curtain we were up real high and we could see down onto the floor the wrestlers before they came to the curtain and i can remember getting ready to defend the, the little title. And he held the belt laid out on a table and his robe on the table. This guy was more worried about, like, he had a mirror, like a handheld mirror. He was more worried about, like, brushing his hair, getting the belt put on right, um, putting his robe. I, I didn't understand at that time, like, what the hell is this guy doing? This guy's going to go out here and fight and defend this title. And he's back here, like, brushing his hair. But when Flair went through the curtain, that, that presentation of, like, looking the part meant just as much as the match did. And I didn't understand that until I got older. Wow. What do you do if you're going behind the curtain? You guys, right now, if we would come behind the curtain at IWC or Imagine, yeah, you would out. throttle us. There would be somebody like me to, to kindly show you back your seat. <laughs> and, and I respect that because we tell everybody on the show, you know, that there's a place for us people, the podcasters or fans, and it's not in the ring. That's something that we preach over and over that we laugh at the people that run in the ring and you guys stomp out because you're idiots. Um, speaking of, uh, you said you weren't a huge WCW fan. You do... I won't say one of, probably the best fall away slam and then kip up of anybody that does that combination. Were you at all a Razor Ramon fan or a Scott Hall fan? Um, it was me putting together, like, peeling the curtain back a little bit here. It was more of trying to find, uh, and I was a Scott Hall fan. Um, I'm not taking nothing away from him. Finding two good moments that I can piece together <laughs> in a match to, to let the audience know this guy, this, like I'm on top. I'm rocking and rolling. You're not going to stop me. And those two moments, like back to back, help nail that home. So you brought up that, you know, Warrior and Hogan were some of your favorites, and John just brought up Scott Hall. Um, otherwise, who else? Who, who else were some of your big guys? Because John's going to mark on this. I, I see a lot of Big John Stud in you as well. Really? That, um, not really a Big John Stud fan, but I have had matches against his son, Sean Stud. We did a tag match a few years back, and the guy's a great guy. Like, in and out of the ring, like, fantastic. Like, pure thoroughbred. But, like, for me, um, anyone that knows me personally um, – like I mentioned Warrior, I mentioned Hogan. Like those were like during my young, like real young. But uh, as I got a little older, I would say, you know, double digits, maybe 10, 11. Um, I really like The Undertaker really sucked me in. And he, he's been my guy ever since. So with this year being his uh, retirement, like official retirement, man, that, that, that was a piece of me that, that's – my childhood, and everyone talks about that. Like that, that's a piece of their childhood because Undertaker's like around forever. But he's always been like my guy, my like number one. That that's my guy. Um, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no. My other, uh, and I get a lot of flack for this, but it took me a minute to get on the bandwagon, and, and I miss seeing the guy around. But um, John Cena, John Cena's my other guy. Oh, nice. So I'm going like, with that. 
Yeah, like one and one A, man. Like Cena is, uh, as far as the presentation of John Cena, like if you were running a wrestling company, I know why that guy's on top. I know why that guy's number one. I, no doubt in my mind. I know why he is who he is and where he is. I, I'm all right with John Cena too, John. I actually thought since you were a bigger guy and I, I thought you were going to say that you're on board with Brock Lesnar and then I was probably going to stop recording. But, okay, John. Uh, <laughs> dislike Brock. I like when Brock's around. Now, you'll get more of, a, more of the wrestler out of me here. Um, the reason I like Brock Lesnar so much is uh, I'm, I'm putting weight together. The reason I like Brock Lesnar so much is not just the, you know, the, the guy's a big guy, he's muscular, he takes, takes the gym seriously. This is obviously something, you know, near and dear to me as I do. Uh, but Brock Lesnar has such a, 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 like a presentation to him. When Brock Lesnar is on the card, whether you love him or hate him, he somehow, like, not just must see, can't miss. Like, when he's on, it's like, ah, damn it, like, ah. All right, I, I got to check this out. Like, I, I don't want to, but like, damn it, let's see, let's see what this is about. And he never, never disappoints. His matches are always on point. Like they're exactly what you'd expect. Um, except for uh, except for recently, some of the the more recent ones, uh, the shorter matches, like four or five minute matches, he's had um, little disappointment there. But like, if you go back and watch his match a few years ago with Daniel Bryan. Phenomenal. Phenomenal stuff. Brock Lesnar is way underrated as what they like to call sports entertainment. His, uh, I'll agree, his body language, his facial expressions really do a nice job telling a story. He knows what to do and when to do it. He does. Brock is phenomenal. Phenomenal. He does. So we, we talked about your love for professional wrestling as a as a youngster. What was or who was like the deciding factor to get you to go train? Um, wasn't any one particular. I had some uh, had some real uh, real tough times I fell on, and uh, it was a matter of just making sure I was financially stable before I could do it. And I had a friend of mine take me to Altoona, uh, no, I'm sorry, Indiana, PA, uh, to train with APWF. And I was there for about six months or so, and a spot opened up for me and Altoona to train with uh, Cato. So I went and seen Cato, and Cato was like, all right, you're good. You move around good. You're very athletic. But you don't know shit. <laughs> I was like, well, I'm right <laughs> But I'm wrestling on shows. I, I have to know. So it, it, well, no, you don't. So he breaks me down and rebuilds me, and I realized after, like, the first training session, like, huh, I, I, I don't know shit. <laughs> so he, he really broke me down and, and rebuilt me the right way. So you were saying that you met Cato um, and you'd had some matches. How far in your wrestling career then were you before you met him? Probably a year or so. Okay. Uh, I met him right away because he was doing the APWF shows as well. <sighs> and um, he, again, he liked that I was a big guy. He liked that I moved around good. He did not like uh, what I was dressed like. Um, I was head to toe black spandex, and I was a masked wrestler known as the Insaniac. And he takes one look at me and walks me over to, you know, the guy's running the show and goes, Somebody explain this to me. Why is the biggest guy here completely covered from head to toe? And I don't remember the explanation or the reason given, but I kind of, like, stepped back and, like, put my hands up. and like Because at that time, you know, you don't really want to ruffle feathers. You're, you're just trying to get by. You're just trying to do what you're told. Like you're not really speaking up much. And he was a little more to the, to the point where he still talks about it. Let's put it like that. It's been... You know, 14 years or so, he, he still brings that up to me. About a year and a half ago, maybe a couple of years ago, um, you did an interview with uh, with Closed Fist, and this is sort of along the same lines, uh, Closed Fist, I think out of Western New York, and, and you gave a great answer. You talked about 
how you worked on the structure of a match for a couple of years, and then you worked on yourself uh, yeah. for a couple of years, and then you worked on psychology for about another year or two. So, so we're in the four to five to six year range before you felt like a, a complete athlete, a complete wrestler. Um, the business has changed in, in the last Absolutely. couple of years, the last few years. Do you think wrestlers mm-hmm. today have that luxury, you know, with, with – the, the bigger company saying we're going to work less, which is good. If guys today can work less and make more, that's great. But you think they're they're missing out on some of those uh, formidable years? Um, yeah, a little bit. Uh, territory days, it, 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 of course I wasn't around for that. If you hear the, the way the territory days were explained, you didn't uh, – you worked with different guys. You worked uh, different loops, different territories. There was different styles the way they worked matches, the way their audience responded to different matches. If you travel now, even on the Indies, um, you mentioned like Western New York in the Buffalo area, they they will, the audience there responds to something totally different than they do like when I'm in Virginia. When I'm in Virginia, it's a totally different thing. It, it's either slowed down, it's that southern atmosphere. Um, Everybody likes it's kind of like eggs, man, or, or chicken. Everybody likes it different. Um, so you got to know where you're at and, and what the audience is into, and adjust your material accordingly. But um, as far as what some of the guys are missing, I definitely think they're missing out on. Uh, definitely think they're missing out on, on working as much because even like with the WWE loop. These guys only wrestle with each other. They're on the same loops. They're they're doing pretty much, and this is in the you know trash talk in WWE. But they're on the same loop. They're all wrestling the same guys. It, it, and people think that we we put everything together like a dance step. Well, you really don't. If you work with somebody enough times, you don't have to put it together like a dance step. You you, you kind of know your dance partners, so you can just kind of go out and, and do your dance. Yeah, but as far as I'm concerned, I like to I like to work with different people. I like to see what they do different. I like to see what they like, um, how you know how the audience is responding. If I'm on later, I'll watch. I'll watch some of the matches. Okay, this is what's working. This is what isn't. This this worked really well. This didn't, uh, and adjust my material accordingly. So uh, we've watched, obviously, you know, we've seen you wrestle live. We can go to YouTube and and see a bunch of your matches. Some of the old timers talk about, you know, I I sent Pat Patterson tapes every month or I called him every week or whatever. Um, So those guys can find you now on on YouTube. How do you go about marketing yourself? How does a wrestler market himself in 2020 and 2021? Are you still sending Obviously not VHS tapes. I have Mark knows I love the VHS. <laughs> I still have mine. But how, how do you market yourself in this day and age? Um, it seems like social media is, is the way to go now. Uh, with there being so much content and so much uh, oversaturation, in my opinion, with uh, content, social media is how guys are marketing themselves. You know, if you do something cool on social media or you do a, a, a cool move, or, or some cold wrestling spot. It seems like people are into that. Like, oh, wow, check this out. And, and usually that's all you'll see is snippets uh, of things, not necessarily full matches. But I think that's what's doing it now more than anything. Yeah, you see people showing stuff on Twitter, which congratulations, you just joined. We'll get to all those social medias at the end of the show. But I recently noticed that one of your IWC running mates, um, the daredevil Johnny Patch, started a TikTok. Uh, Could we see Bill Collier on TikTok um, shaking his pecs anytime soon? I would not hold your breath for that. (laughs) Just ask it, because Johnny Patch is, and I thought, well, if you're going to kind of take some of the Johnny Patch way, I could see you on there. That's a joke. <laughs> um, joking aside, joking aside, we do want to say uh, congratulations. You have been on the PWI Top 500 for 10 years. Um, that's amazing. You have... 
super, super, superstars that are not on this list for 10 years. How, how much do you take into that that you're on that list? Um, you know, I am very fortunate that I am. We'll, we'll put it like that. Um, uh, I, 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 it's almost like I can't believe that uh, I have been. Like, looking back, it's, it, it's something. It, it really is. Uh, I've, I, I can remember the first year that I was on, uh, the guy that uh, wrote the top 500 was uh, Dan Murphy. And he happened to be at an event, and he was there to see my ex-girlfriend and also Corey Graves uh, from WWE was wrestling on the show. It was actually his promotion. And afterwards, he came up to me and he said, hey, man, that was outstanding. Uh, I like your stuff. Do you want to be on the top 500? Uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> and then I started wrestling in ESW, which is in the uh, – Buffalo area. Uh, they wrestle a lot in North Tonawanda, Buffalo, Niagara Falls area. And Dan Murphy lives in that area. So there's an opportunity for Dan to see me regularly develop and see me wrestle. It wasn't a thing of like, oh, hey, you know, we're pals, we're buddies, put me on there. It, it was always a, it always boiled down to my work, which I was very happy that, you know, I was considered to be in a row. So I have to say this, you um, you killed a portion of our childhood and even our 40s, because Mark and I, to this day, we look for that PWI 500 and we, we flip through it and we're like, well, Bill Collier's on there because he wrestled Andrew Powell's and we take it seriously. And here's just some story about, hey, man, you want to be in this thing? I want to sure. be on it next year then. Yeah, I want to be in it too, if that's all it takes. <laughs> well, no, he was he was there and he watched me wrestle. It's what oh, so you have to rust. Okay. Oh. Absolutely. It wasn't a. It wasn't a thing of. Hey, I like you. You're my friend. You want to do this? Okay. Uh, he. It, it was my work that did the talking for me. All right. But so uh, I, I may have misunderstood. It, yeah. No, no. Yeah, he was absolutely. He was absolutely. Um, I, I don't know if he was impressed, but he really liked my stuff. He's like, hey, wow, this, you know, I'm a big guy. If you see me wrestle, I'm a big guy. I move around good. Um, especially back then <laughs> when I was a little younger, but, uh, he liked my stuff and he always has. Uh, so that's, that's kind of what did it there. Not, not so much like, Hey man, you, you know, you think you got a spot here? You got 500 guys. Did you slide me in? <laughs> no, that, that wasn't it. Damn it. We were hoping. Uh, I want to talk about one. Of, I want to talk about one of my most memorable matches with you. It was August 1st, 2015 with, um, one of my favorite wrestlers in IWC, Jimmy Nuts, and it took place at White Oak. And Nuts was champion. He'd just come back, uh, just kind of back in the thing again. You threw him from pillar to post. You had our kids crying on the way out. Jimmy Nuts' mother was there in tears. And then he somehow ends up getting a win over you. I still say that's my favorite IWC match ever because I I was laid up legitimately with a, a bum knee. And you legit threw Jimmy on my knee. And I'm like, oh, Christ, what am I going to do if I die tonight? Nothing. Bill Collier doesn't care. <laughs> no, I absolutely didn't. Um, we still, Jimmy and me still talk about that when we see each other. Uh, I, again, I... I just had this idea. I ran it by him. I said, so, you know, what do you think? And he liked it. It was different. It was something that uh, people weren't normally doing. So that's what we did. We did something different. And a lot of people that were there remember that, including Jimmy Nuts himself. And that's what I'm pretty proud of. If you can get, if you can have the audience, how long ago was that? It's more than five years. Yeah, Six and now, yeah. Five years. Six years. Yeah. Five years and you're still talking about it. How about yeah. that? Yeah. Um, the first time I saw you wrestle, Bill, I think it was for Big Time Wrestling, if I'm not mistaken, maybe seven or eight years ago. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that was the event where, you know, my, uh, we were sitting front row and I had my son with me who was maybe three or four at the time. And you did this thing when you were introduced. You threw your hand in the air and, and let out a bellow. It, 
a la Stan Hansen, I guess. And it was so loud that it, it, it was like a cartoon. It blew my son's face and hair back. Um, and he was scared of you ever since then. And this is true, listeners. My son had to go to the bathroom. So I take him to the bathroom. And who walks in and steps up to the urinal next to us? But big time Bill Collier. And what about them? <laughs> yeah, how about that? And my son's uh, my son just froze. Um, you're you're a great good guy. You really are. You're a great good guy. You're a really good bad guy. Uh, is there one you prefer over the other? Um, no, I would say no. Some guys are better at one than the other. I um. It, it depends on how a promoter sees me. You know, am I am I a good guy? Am I a bad guy? What what do they need for the moment? Do they need a monster heel, or do they need this you know big badass baby face? Uh, so each each place sees me a little different. So I had to adapt quick. Normally, if you're smaller and you're faster, you're normally a good guy. If you're a little bigger, you know, a little stronger, you're you're probably a you know probably a bad guy. Uh. But I, I fall into this weird gray area where I can be either just as effective. So he's Stone Cold because Stone Cold was either good or bad. You yeah. need, it depends on it who you talk to. Him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bill, I'm going to bring up some names. You have a like I said, 13 years in the business, so you have a who's who you crossed uh, past list at some point, but some that just really stand out. Uh, I really want to get some some words from you, if you can remember. Um, you crossed paths with Butterbean? What? Yes, I have. That is 100% true. I have wrestled Butterbean. It was for uh, JT Lightning. Uh, bless JT Lightning. He's no longer with us. But it was for JT Lightning and Cleveland All-Pro. And um, they were bringing Butterbean in. And I guess they were scrambling looking for a guy that uh, they thought could, A, look, look sizable to Butterbean. Because I don't know if you know this, Butterbean's a large <laughs> gentleman. Yes, he is. And not just, like, look the part, but Butterbean's not a wrestler. So not just look the part, get Butterbean through it. Help him along. Make sure that this, you know, the, the audience feels like they get their money's worth. So, yeah, I... Uh, I wrestled Butterbean, I want to say that was summer 2009 or 10, possibly, possibly no, but, but 2009, 2010. Ish, yeah, so I didn't write down the dates. I was only wrestling for maybe two years, and then I get a call like, hey, you're going to wrestle uh, Butterbean here. I'm like, oh, yeah, fantastic. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any like anybody that would be like, wow, like, like you really did that? But yeah, Butterbean definitely comes to mind first, like. When you talk about like a, a a who's who of who you wrestled, Butterbean is is on on the top of that list for sure. Yeah, because it's so it, it's so unexpected. It and when I saw that, I'm like, what? Um, so I, you said the Butterbean. We all know Butterbean's a bigger guy. Uh, when you fought the Blue Meanie, was it kind of the same thing? Since you know he's a thicker guy as well, you just got thrown into that match. Uh, I wrestled Blue Meanie. I probably had two, less than 10 matches. So Blue Meanie was, and, and he knew that. And he was very, uh, very receptive to working with me, very receptive to getting me through it, helping me along, explaining why we were doing things, where we were going. Also, my uh, my fourth wrestling match ever, uh, I was in a six-man tag against uh, Abyss. So, the, you know, that's kind of how I started. You know, four matches in, I'm wrestling Abyss, and ten matches in, Blue Meanie. Uh, so that I was getting thrown into the fire pretty quick, and like I said, still didn't know, didn't know a damn thing about what I was doing. <laughs> so these guys, those guys were instrumental in helping me out. I would imagine in that regard, then you know, while they're similarly sized, obviously Blue Meanie, uh, accomplished wrestler, comes from that background, so probably very dis different circumstances from when you wrestled Blue Meanie as opposed to Butterbean. Well, completely. Yeah, now, now sure. I'm not taking anything away from Butterbean. Butterbean was a fantastic gentleman. 
and, and nothing but a gentleman. It was a pleasure to be around. Um, fun, it, really fun to talk to. But as far as like being out in the ring, it, you you want to be out there with Blue Meat. <laughs> See, I um, I was a Bart Gun fan back in the day, so <laughs> Butterbean is still a sore subject for me. But I'm I'll sure take your word for it that he was a really good guy. Oh yeah, absolutely, great guy. He Butterbean recently just joined TikTok too, so him and Johnny Patch have two things in common. One, they're on TikTok, and then I won't let you. Uh, you guys can guess what the other one is, but nonetheless, we love Johnny Patch. But Johnny Patch is a guy I wouldn't mind beating up sometime soon. See, there you go. <laughs> Stir the pot. Let's go with this, John. That'd be a good match. Book that, Justin Plummer. We know you're listening. Yeah, he's a guy I wouldn't beat up. Um, with that, with IWC, I guess, sort of maybe on a bit of a hiatus until the weather gets a little warmer and they can maybe be outdoors again. Um, what's your focus been? Obviously, you're staying in shape, um, but, but where else is your head right now? Uh, more or less, that's it. Uh, staying in shape because you never know what will happen because you know, my phone could ring at any time from anyone at any place. Uh, you never know. Stranger things have happened. Uh, so I just keep myself in shape. And th- this time it's a little different. I haven't, like, disconnected from wrestling completely like I did last time. But because um, I'm not feeling quite as sorry for myself. <laughs> but uh, until there's some sort of, like, definitive with wrestling, uh, I- I'm keeping it uh, I'm keeping it close. But right now, more than anything, I'm uh, – Focused on being a dad um, here at home, being a father, and uh, by the way, it, it's my favorite job. <laughs> uh, I have a, a son and a daughter. My my daughter was born in September, uh, and my son was born in 1998. So there's a 22 year gap between my son and my daughter. <laughs> Wow. Uh, I knew you had two kids. I didn't know the gap was 22 years. Um, so my question that I was going to ask you, because I was going to portray it about, you know, your new baby girl. Um, how does being a dad change your career? But for the love of God, you've been doing this for 22 years of being a dad. And by the way, you're right. The dad, the dad is the best job you can have. Absolutely, uh, and it, it doesn't change it at all. Uh, my son was you know, eight years old, maybe, when I started wrestling, and he's been around it ever since. Like he's been he's been in it with me, like going to training, going on the road. He's he's been my road partner a lot. Um, some of the guys I used to ride with, <laughs> Devin would be right. My son's name is Devin, by the way. He'd be right there with it, um, in the car with us having a good time, and, and occasionally he's a quiet kid, but occasionally you'd hear him crack a, crack a joke or two on the road. It was great times. Did he inherit the uh, big-time genes of, uh, of being six foot plus and 250 pounds? He absolutely did not. Oh. Um, <laughs> he's 5'10", maybe, but uh, he, he's a little thicker. 5'10", uh, I want to say he's somewhere around the 205-pound mark, 210-pound mark. He's that kid. He's strong. I want to say pound for pound, this is going to sound strange, pound for pound, he's probably stronger at his age than I was at at the same age. Wow. Well, the technology, the technology from our day and age to now, without a doubt, gives him that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But like I said, he's, he's probably pound for pound, like, stronger than I was. Wow. Um, not so much today. Like, like he's not. Not today. He's going to crunch. Yeah, you want to crunch pure numbers, well, I'll blow him away. But, but pound for pound, yeah, he's probably stronger at 22 than I was at 22. That's a, good, that's a great dad remark, by the way, John. We both would have said that. Like, we could Absolutely. still crush Ethan or Sylvan if we had to. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Right uh, now, if they want a tag team match, we'll do it right now. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. Let's get into some of your nerdy things and, and take a break from wrestling. We, we hear you working out. We know you're working out, but... You have a body that John and I could only hope for on a wrestling game, but you have to have a guilty pleasure. Like, are you a pizza fan? What do what you just mow down when you get the day off? Uh, pizza. Pizza's my number one. And a lot of people are, are blown away when they hear this. 
I don't, uh, I'm not on a special diet. Like I'm not carb counting. I'm not, I make sure I get my protein, but I'm not like carb counting, not fat counting. I'm not like, well, you know, this many macros and this is my meal plan. As long as I'm eating every two hours, uh, I eat whatever I want, just uh, sensibly, of course. Like I'm not chowing down like pizza and burgers every night, <laughs> but um, if it comes up during the week, it's not off the menu. I eat whatever I want. I, I just I eat in moderation. I eat every two hours, uh, maybe a little heavier than a normal person, but for someone my size, perfectly normal, perfectly normal appetite, and I eat whatever I want. I am in no special diet. John, after three, four years of this show, I still don't understand what that word moderation means. You really have to help me out because you, I, yeah, you don't know what that word means. I Let's really, clear. I don't yeah. know. Um, how about some of your nerdy stuff? Uh, your son's twenty-two. Who, you know, uh, the the baby's not playing video games or anything yet. I mean, are you guys a video game heads or anything like that? My son is yes, but uh, me. Not so much. I have a few video game systems, but I'm not too big on them. Like, I'll get bored every once in a while, and uh, I'll kick on a video game system. <clears throat> I like, uh, I hate, I hate any of the new wrestling games. Yeah. Uh, for for someone like me that grew up in the uh, 8-bit graphic era, some of the new video games, it's, it's, <laughs> they're a little tough to deal with. No but kidding. The, it seems like the setup takes forever. <laughs> yes. Yeah. A, a whole match could have happened on the Nintendo or Nintendo 64 by the time you get a headlock on somebody right now. It's horrible. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Um, simplify that, man. Just like we say in the ring, simplify that. We'll work smarter, not harder. Um, uh, some of the it's hard to say, like, some of the nerdier things. Like, um, not a real big video game guy. What I do enjoy is summer weather because I like being outdoors. Like, my motorcycle's a big deal for me. Anyone that knows me personally knows that my motorcycle's a big deal. Like, I, I ride. That's what I do. Nice. What do, you, what do you have? Yeah, yeah. I have a 2004 Suzuki Hayabusa that I bought brand new in 2004 and i've had it ever since excellent uh, a lot of people, yeah a lot of people a lot of people picture me like on a big harley like street glide or something like that and i gotta be honest they they look pretty and i'm very tempted but uh i've had my motorcycle for what would it be 16 17 years now and yeah, hard to let go real hard to let go uh, getting back to wrestling just a little bit earlier, you talked about the fact that there was a period where, um, you know, recently you, you didn't think about it. Um, you, you kind of put it aside for the time being, um, as the Pittsburgh pro wrestling classic, uh, been on your mind and we'll dig a little deeper into, into what transpired there, but the way it ended, is that providing any motivation? For anything you're doing, um, is Andrew Palace on the brain with every rep that, that you're doing? Absolutely. And, and the only reason he is is because he's the IWC heavyweight champion. I, I would be lying if I, if I said that wasn't a goal of mine. It absolutely is. Uh, for a lot of years, uh, I, I've never been a regular at IWC. I was kind of like there, then not, then there, then not. Um, and just recently... Am I you know, dug in at IWC and fairly regular? And from afar, I've kind of looked at the IWC title while being out and being uh, champions, you know, in Erie at Revenge and ESW, and I've been champion in, in Greek Town and, and like Imagine now and a bunch of other places. The IWC title was one that I've always kind of looked at from afar and was like, you know, if, if there were a list of titles of places I've been that I that I really, really want, that's one of them. And now I have an opportunity. Uh, I'm not saying I have a title shot coming, but like there there's a possibility that like if I get slid into that, that challenger role for that title, I'm not going to take pity on Andrew Palace. I'm not going to feel sorry for Andrew Palace. I am going to do whatever I need to do to become IWC heavyweight champion. 
So for those listeners who are unfamiliar with the Pittsburgh Pro Wrestling Classic, um, you can see it on the IWC Network for nine ninety nine a month. Guys, it really is great independent wrestling. Um, but that show kicked off with a, uh, a tag team match. Um, Jack Pollock was supposed to challenge Jock Sampson for the championship. Uh, Jack Pollock was a no-show. To my knowledge, Mark, we still don't know no clue what happened where or, or where he is. Um, so Justin Plummer threw together a tag team match. And uh, if you uh, and Palace, uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, if they won, then they would be thrown into a triple threat match later that night, if I'm remembering correctly. Before we get to the triple threat match, how badly did you want to get your hands on Deputy Murphy, considering he had a couple of cheap wins against you? Um, and there was that moment, there was a scary moment where he actually had you pinned, and those of us that are fans yours were thinking, oh boy, here we go again. <laughs> um, I couldn't wait to get my hands on him. For months and months, that's all I heard about is, is how Deputy Don's 2-0, and he's 2-0, and he's 2-0. And, and if, if you were around to see either of those, you know how cheap they were. But uh, Deputy Don will be able to, uh, you know, hopefully from his comatose state, because I heard he still hasn't woken up yet. Um, he can relish in that for a while. You know, he, he's 2-0 and back-to-back. I don't think anyone's ever beaten me back-to-back twice. So, Don Murphy has a uh, – he holds a record, so to speak. How about that? <laughs> Good for him. <laughs> uh, and then one other follow-up to that. So you guys win the match. You're thrown into yep. a triple threat match with Jock Sampson, winner's a champion. On your way back – and these guys, they're, they're troublemakers, uh, the regulators. Push okay. one of you into the other one, and, and you guys had some confusion there. Maybe you thought Andrew Palace was, was – coming up behind you did you have a chance to look at that and have you guys talked about that well i looked at it and, and you know with Andrew palace i mean there's no real love loss between us but uh i was like you know with everything we've been through you're gonna you're gonna shove me here with my back turned and you're gonna shove me here now but i've had a chance to go back and look at it and i see that it was jock sampson but that has no bearing on whether or not I'll drop Palace where he stands for the IWC title. I will absolutely ball my fist up, and I will throw it as hard as I can in any area above his shoulders to be IWC heavyweight champion. Wow. Uh, hopefully that happens real soon. Um, I'd want IWC to open back up. I want Imagine to open back up. Uh, before we let you go, we have a couple more questions here. Um, one, how much wrestling do you get to watch nowadays? Uh, AEW, WWE, New Japan, a- anything out there? And then I have a, I have a deep question I want you to be an analyst for, but answer the first one first. Um, I really don't watch. I really don't watch a lot of wrestling. Um, I wish I had time to watch a little more. Uh, I'll probably catch uh, snippets here and there of like a Raw or SmackDown. I'll see clips of like AEW Dynamite here and there. Uh, I'm, I'm on a really busy schedule, so I don't get much time. Uh, normally when I'm with my son, he will stop me, sit me down, and be like, you have to watch this. And we'll sit and watch wrestling a bit. But um, – for the most part, I don't get to watch as much as I'd like to. Okay. So, all right, you've been in the ring with both of these guys, and I'm talking about it because it's happening tonight on AEW Dynamite. We're going to get to see Wardlow taking on Jake Hager. You were tag team partners with Wardlow at one time. You've run into a brick wall with Wardlow sometimes. You fought Jack Swagger. Break them down and tell me who you got. Tonight, Ooh, that, that's that's going to be a tough one to call. Uh, Wardlow has to stay vertical. He has to use his strength. He has to use his power because he's strong. One of the few guys I can name on one hand how many guys you know match up strength wise with me. Wardlow is one of them. Uh, Shane Taylor being another one. Brock Singleton being one. Calvin McGrath, maybe Ray Rowe uh, cracks that list as well. But like. Th- those are the strongest guys I've ever been in the ring with. Uh, Wardlow is definitely one of them. 
he has to stay he has to stay upright he has to throw bombs he has to hit him hit him hard and hit a lot and for swagger he has to take the match to the mat he's an accomplished amateur wrestler he has an MMA background he has to get Wardlow on the mat if he gets Wardlow on the mat you know he has a chance to win if it stays upright and Wardlow has the edge so it's a tough one to call so I mean it's it's anybody's match really it's, it'll be down to who makes the biggest mistake do you have do you personally have a favorite though uh no not not offhand i mean i'm a little obviously uh, i know wardlow a little better than i do swagger but i don't have a personal favorite um for me uh i hope they kill each other <laughs> all right <laughs> I hope they kill each other so then this uh, is everybody wins then right yeah this is maybe an obvious question then if, if we throw you in the mix too it's a, a three-way dance well, if you throw me in the in it, you know, no disrespect to the two of those. I mean, again, anything above their shoulders, I'm throwing bombs at. Nice. All right. Uh, uh, we want to know. That's what Mike Tyson would do, right? Absolutely. <laughs> we want to. We want to know. Um, Thirteen years into the business, uh, what's your goals for the next five? Um, I, I know, and we'll keep saying this. New baby, so you, you kind of want to stay around. But what, what's your goals for the next five? Uh, obviously, uh, the the same as it's been. It's it's an easier time now than it's ever been. With there being two major wrestling companies, uh, there's a lot of opportunity. But I, I you know, a contract, a, a major contract in wrestling would be, you know, is what the goal is for sure. Is there any chance of? Uh... Some of the guys, you know, like we've had Jimmy Nuts on here, and, and he talked about Elias um, being in the WWE. Um, obviously, your old partner Wardlow's in AEW. Is it common for someone to throw a name around and say, hey, I have someone who I think could work. You guys ought to look at him. Um, I, I've done it, you know, on the indies. It's, you know, you need a big guy. You're looking for a big guy. You know, I have uh, – I, I know of a guy, and I would mention somebody I think fits the bill. I so it's, um, it, it's, it's hard to say at that level when there's when they're throwing around. You know, it, it's easier to pay somebody a few hundred dollars this for you know a six figure contract. That's right. you know that's a big like hey you know my guy over here. Uh, let's give out everybody your, your social medias because you're so good at that, but maybe you should have somebody run them, but at least, <laughs> at least people can give you a follow or, you know, reach out to you and then, uh, merch or anything that you want to sell as well. Uh, right now I'm a little uh, short on merch, but anytime I'm at an event, I should have something for you. You can follow me on Twitter, at big bill Collier, uh, Facebook, bill Collier. You can give me a follow there see what I'm up to, see what I'm doing. I usually post uh, I usually post anything that I'm doing on my social media so you know where I'm going to be, know what I'm going to be doing, and who I'm going to be knocking out. So go ahead and give those a follow. Do you have anything coming up? I know around this area it's a little rough, but I know if you travel to, like, Tennessee or something, you might be able to get anything. But do you have anything that you want to shout out to people? As of right now, no. Just keep looking, and hopefully, you know, if there there has been no wrestling in your area, or there is, and you want to see me in your area, you know, reach out, let me know, contact a wrestling company. Hopefully, we can make something happen. But until you know things start to open up, you know, everybody's hands are kind of tied right now. So in the meantime, just just here at home, here at the gym, trying to uh, trying to stay in good shape. That way, when that time comes, I have a heavy bag and a speed bag here. Anything above the shoulders. And being a great dad. That's what I like. Absolutely. All right, Bill, we'll let you go. Continue to work out tonight. Uh, thanks for stack stopping by Can Crushers. Uh, it was great. We'll have you on as soon as you win that IWC title, right? I appreciate that. Yes, you absolutely will. I appreciate that, guys. Thanks a lot. That was a big-time interview with big-time Bill Collier, Mark. He was multitasking. He was talking to us. He was lifting weights. He was getting ready to beat somebody up. 
That sounded like big time weights too, John. That's not like a, a ten pound bag of potatoes that we carry around to pretend to be lifting. Right. And you take one end, I take the other end. Yeah, that sounded like he was. Oh my god, my god, he was really ripping into it. But what a humble, great human being. I love that his number one job is being a dad. I mean, John, we're we're very much the same way. We love wrestling. Bill loves wrestling. But when somebody says that. That just moves the interview up to, you know, top five overall because he knows family first, man. That's awesome. Yep. He's, uh, seems like he's got a good head on his shoulders. Uh, family man, career oriented, um, talented in the ring. Guys, if you haven't seen him, just look him up. Look up his matches on YouTube. He's a very good athletic big man. Can do all the power stuff, but can do the quick stuff. Um, Watch his matches. Yeah, you can also check him out on IWC Network. Nice promo, by the way, in the interview, John. IWC I'm getting ne- better at this, Mark. You are. IWCNetwork.com for only $9.99 a month. Um, you'll see that Jimmy Nuts match that I think is one of my all-time favorite IWC matches on there. John, and I know I dropped some stuff on you. How about the, the comparison between Butterbean and Blue Meanie within his like first year? That's amazing. Yeah, that is pretty wild. Um, and again, other than, you know, the outwardly appearance, it was night and day for big time because he was wrestling somebody with uh, a good number of years under his belt versus zero experience. That's like wrestling me and you. That's right. And strong words towards IWC heavyweight champion right now, Andrew Palace. He better have his head on a swivel. He better. Um, they've been in the ring before. Um, Palace is tenacious, but I would give the edge to big time, not just because I'm a big fan, but, um, I, I just think he's, he's a better wrestler. Wow. Yeah. And I'm an Andrew Palace fan too, but you watch those guys in the ring, which we have, um, big time, he, he bumps them around. He does bump them around. We didn't, we didn't come uh, across talking about back in business, which was, Kind of our IWC match of the year uh, when Palace and Collier brought it back from quarantine. We didn't. I don't know why we skipped over it, but well, it, we kind of touched on that, right? Yeah, he, he opened there and then we shifted the whole ass somewhere yeah. else. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he did it too a day. That's old school. That is old school. Yeah, that's from Pittsburgh or it was Brownsville to El Tuna. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. So. Yeah. Imagine heavyweight champion as well, him and Slade. I know uh, Imagine has a collection out there as well that you can buy kind of when you're at the events. Those are two great matches as well. Big time Bill Collier. Guys, let's get his name out there. Let's get him looked at by any one of the big ones because he deserves to be there. He really does. If he wins the IWC belt, he could be two belts, Bill. I'm sure he'd love that nickname. I hope yeah. he punches you first, then me. <laughs> Big time's better, but Big think time. about it. Two belts, Bill. Remember, John, just because you're trash with that comment. It doesn't mean you can't do great things. It's called a garbage can. Not a garbage cannot.